welcome everyone today to today's uh, seminar as part of the Cambridge Sociology Seminar Series. Uh, today's topic is on the theme of nationalism. The kind of underlining theme is studying nationalism from a sociological <laughs> viewpoint. So uh, with that in mind, it's, it's very uh, great for us uh, over here in, in Cambridge to be welcoming two of the leading voices on nationalism um, in UK sociology. So um, today we're welcoming Dr. Megan Tinsley, who is a Presidential Fellow in Ethnicity and Inequality at the University of Manchester. Um, and we're also joined by Dr. Sivamohan Valuvan, who is an Assistant Professor in Sociology over at the University of Warwick. Uh, Valu has written this amazing book, The Clamour of Nationalism, which I know myself and many of my students have found um, as one of the most useful texts to be referring to when we're studying nationalism in a contemporary period. Um, and I know that Megan's book is releasing very shortly, and I'm sure that it's going to have just as much of an impact um, on sociological understandings of nationalism. Um, so for those of you who are joining us today from outside of Cambridge, we also want to welcome you. One thing that we've been working on really hard with this seminar series is with the online turn to not just have jazzy intros as provided by Joe, but also to really be reaching out to um, loads of other people who are interested in all of these really pressing topics. Um, so you can also take part in uh, watching this via YouTube. Feel free to tweet us at, at Cam, Soci Cam Sociology. Um, and hopefully we can continue this conversation well beyond uh, the hour and a half or so that we have. So um, I think it would be good to pass on to the two presenters now. What's going to happen is Megan's going to do her presentation first and then Fadu's going to do a presentation. They'll both be around 20 minutes or so and then there's going to be plenty of time for a QA. and a um, Use the chat function if you want to kind of ask questions as we go along and I'll store them up and we can ask them after the two presentations. Otherwise, you can also use the raise hand function in the Q&A and I'll, um, I'll come to you so that you can uh, show, show your face so it doesn't feel like we're speaking into a void. So without any further ado, Megan, do you want to kick us off? Thanks, Ali. Uh, thank you for the introduction and for uh, the invitation to speak today. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to speak alongside Valu too. Um, I've enjoyed his book and I've engaged with it in my own work. Um, and it's exciting to be speaking face-to-face -face, um, now and to, to be able to engage with each other directly. I think there's going to be a lot of, um, uh, a lot of fodder for discussion in, um, in the two presentations. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to try to share my screen. Yes. Okay, and presentation mode. Okay, right. So I'm going to focus my remarks today on patriotism. I've been reflecting on the appeal of patriotism on the center left as an antidote to nationalism, or even as Emmanuel Macron has said, the opposite of nationalism. In Britain, uh, patriotism has found support amongst labor politicians of all stripes, from Rebecca Long Bailey to Lisa Nandy, while the substance of their patriotism has ranged from a green industrial revolution to dressing smartly at the war memorial, uh, they're united in their call to reclaim patriotism from the right, whose own understanding of patriotism encompasses activities including draping houses in bunting for the E-Day, clapping for the NHS, and going to the pub. While all of the major parties are eager to proclaim themselves the true patriots, there's remarkably little consensus on the meaning of the term in practice. So I'm going to argue that this is not simply semantic slippage, but a reflection of the rhetorical power and exclusionary character of patriotism. Because of its vague but broadly positive connotations, appeals to patriotism render any meaningful opposition unspeakable. Yet patriotism constructs an in-group of citizens who are positioned as the heirs of an authentic national tradition and an out-group of co-citizens who are attempting to hijack the national spirit. Further, despite its global aspirations, patriotism hardens the distinction between citizens and non-citizens. At best, patriotism is an empty signifier. At worst, it's a proxy for nationalism. So I'm going to offer a working definition of patriotism and then unpack it. Uh, as I lay out the literature, I'll emphasize three tensions that imbue the concept, logic versus affect, country versus globality, and theory versus practice. Then I'll delve into the exclusionary character of patriotism, emphasizing this double exclusion of unpatriotic co-citizens and non-citizens. 
And throughout, I'm going to provide a few examples of how it's used in contemporary little, uh, political discourse. Um, I'll highlight the UK context and specifically the Labour Party, uh, but this argument isn't restricted to any particular national context um, or any party. I'll conclude by considering how patriotism creates space for nationalism by another name. So the origin of patriotism in Greco-Roman antiquity is an expression of love for country on the basis of laws and institutions that support the common good. Um, as a quick note on terminology, uh, I'm going to use the term country at this point because it's more general than polity, which emphasizes the institutions of the state uh, or nation, which invokes a shared culture or collective identity. Um, but both of these terms have been used by theorists to describe the patria or the, lo the locus of patriotism. And I will refer to the nation state when I describe contemporary patriotism. Many theorists of patriotism draw from this tradition. Uh, for example, for Viroli, patriotism means adherence to a set of universal values, liberty, justice, democracy, rule of law. These values are put into practice through a country's institutions, which construct citizens, endorse democratic principles, and hold political leaders accountable. Um, this is also Habermas's argument about constitutional patriotism. So with this in mind, love for country entails making that country and its institutions more just and more inclusive. Based on this framing, national attachment is loosely held and instrumental. Patriotism makes little allowance for emotional identification with the country. Further, patriotism is incompatible with loyalty to the nation on the basis of ethnicity, culture, or religion. Yet, herein lies patriotism's first tension. Despite this emphasis on a, a detached reason, affect is inextricable from patriotism. Uh, for some, emotional attachment to one's country strengthens patriotism. It creates a passionate desire for the best for the country, which facilitates critiquing it when it fails to live up to patriotic values. Others read this tension as a contradiction. If a person is bound to their country by emotional attachment, they can't criticize it objectively. This critique has two prongs. Uh, first, it points to the pitfalls of affect at large, positioning it as incompatible with reason. And second, it indicates the dangers of positioning any particular country as the locus of patriotism. The latter concern points to a second tension between patriotism's claim to universality and its emphasis on one's country. This question has imbued patriotism since its inception. What defined the borders of the Greco-Roman polity and the locus of patriotism or ancestry, kinship, and by extension, religion and ethnicity. And so this early notion of patriotism was rooted in a particular place and couldn't be universalized without sacrificing its salience. For contemporary adherence of patriotism, its emphasis on a single country is often framed as a practical rather than a principled stance. The values of patriotism are universal, but they may only be enacted and enforced amongst the community of citizens. Residing within the borders of a country gives citizens sufficient shared experience to construct a collective identity through institutions and practices. Appeals to world citizenship are abstract and don't carry the weight of shared institutions and legal commitments. Certainly some governments might embody patriotic values more effectively than others, but they don't belong to any particular country. Further, if one country ceases to uphold those values, the patriot renounces their loyalty to that country. Yet theorists have also blurred the locus of patriotism. Whereas Voltaire proclaimed loyalty to the patria on the basis of liberty alone, such that the place does not matter, Rousseau saw adherence to the national culture as a useful tool for cultivating political allegiance. Countries provide the symbols and rhetoric for patriotism alongside a community of affect. By appealing to national struggles of the past, for example, patriots claim that those struggles encapsulate the authentic spirit of a country. And at this point, patriotism starts to sound a lot like nationalism. A third tension, which underlies both of the previous two, is between theory and practice. Unlike scholars of nationalism, scholars of patriotism frequently advocate the concept they theorize and characterize themselves as patriots. Both their audiences and their opponents are their co-citizens, and the meaning of their country is contested. Being located in a particular time space brings insights as well as biases and blind spots. Scholars re reference contemporary debates and threats. They appeal to both logic and affect by invoking historical national character, finding evidence in the past for equality, liberty, and justice. This is necessarily a selective search for authenticity that involves disavowing any explicitly ethno-nationalist identity as unpatriotic. 
Such an understanding of patriotism enables theorists to prescribe particular values in institutions, but it also limits the scope of their critique. In particular, writing from a patriotic standpoint presents two concerns. Um, first, advocating for patriotism as a political and social goal encourages an emphasis on short-term political gain. This raises the question of whether patriotism is a strategic means of fostering national unity or whether it's normatively good across time. A second, and by extension, writing from the standpoint of a patriotic citizen for an audience of co-citizens raises the question of whether claims to liberty, justice, and fairness are articulated in the same way across space. Proclaiming the universality of values that are nonetheless rooted in a particular society raises the question of how those values might reflect a given society's or ruling elite's experiences. So it's worth noting here that the most prominent advocates of patriotism are based in formal imperial powers in the global north. Their reflections on the promise of patriotism typically don't distinguish between its logic and its applications across space. But the enlightenment ideals that are frequently named as patriotic values were constructed in tandem with empire and racism. Renaud Parigot recalls that individual liberty was deemed a modern European trait, such that the age of light was inconceivable outside of Europe. By extension, Africa was constructed as the dark continent, terra nullius, an empty space outside of history, waiting to be illuminated by European civilization. And so it was that in 1698, parliamentarians could proclaim without a trace of irony that the right of a free trade in slaves was a fundamental and natural right of Englishmen. So the historical context of empire and slavery raises the question of whether liberal patriotic ideals can ever be applied universally or whether they only carry meaning in opposition to people who don't enjoy those ideals. So having laid out the contestations and tensions of patriotism as a concept, I'd like to point to a more fundamental critique. Regardless of the values it proclaims, patriotism is based on exclusion. So this critique begins with the Hegelian dynamic of binaries at large. Um, collective identity is predicated on distinguishing members from non-members. Consequently, naturalizing a sense of shared identity requires claiming that certain traits are common to all members, but not found among non-members. This is obviously a selective process. It elevates and generalizes certain values, memories, or racialized traits while erasing others. Any challenge to the collective character of these traits would blur the border between a group's members and non-members, and by extension, challenge the integrity of the group at large. This dynamic applies to any collective identity, and it's easy to see its relevance to nationalism. Nations are imagined communities that are consolidated on the basis of a shared language, religion, imagined history, um, or imagined, sorry, I'm just going to plug in my computer here, um, uh, imagined history or uh, imagined culture. <clears throat> uh, these shared traits are made politically salient in opposition to those who don't share them. And thus, nationalism relegates in linguistic, religious, or cultural others outside the nation's symbolic borders. Constructing the imagined community always entails steamrolling internal difference in favor of cohesive, a cohesive national identity. And this is as much the case in post-imperial Europe as it is in post-conflict and post-colonial nation states with externally imposed borders. Defining membership on the basis of patriotism initially would seem to avoid this binaristic logic. Patriots pro profess the universality of their values, such that their polity encompasses all who adhere to the common good. Yet, as we've already seen, the enactment of patriotic values is predicated on the institutions of the nation state, and justifying this project entails naturalizing the idea of the nation. So when a speaker invokes patriotism, they proclaim their understanding of the authentic, desirable values of the nation state. By extension, patriots condemn as unpatriotic their co-citizens who fail to uphold these values, symbolically excluding them from the nation. The values underpinning patriotism are often implicitly racialized, but I want to emphasize here that when it comes to claims about the common good, patriotism might be invoked as an exclusionary term across the political spectrum. For example, whether a patriot calls for greater openness to migrants in the name of tolerance or a more restrictive immigration policy in the name of social cohesion, they specify the character of patriotism and relegate the alternative outside the nation's borders. One example of how patriotism creates internal borders comes from a 2015 speech by uh, Labour MP Lisa Nandy. She has made patriotism a cornerstone of her own platform uh, and speaks about it frequently, but I've chosen this speech uh, because she acknowledges the slippery character of patriotism 
and then lays out very clearly what patriotism is not. She states, <clears throat> patriotism can be a force for good or for ill. And if it's to be a force for good, it starts from an honest assessment and understanding of who we are and the impact we have in the world. It's the, it's the patriotism of Wilfred Owen and his raw, honest, brutal account of war, not the fundamentally dishonest patriotism of Michael Gove and his British values, an exercise, an exercise in historical whitewash and PR, instead of an attempt to understand. It tells you how shallow this commitment to patriotism is in the ranks of the Conservative Party. Because patriotism is as much about learning and challenging as it is about celebrating. And there's nothing patriotic about shutting down dissent, gagging citizens, charities, and trade unions through the Lobbying Act, and a series of attacks on the right to speak. About widening inequality, putting money into the pockets of a wealthy few at the expense of the poorest in the country. Or selling off our shared institutions that, as Jesse Norman rightly said, help to define us as we define them. Northern Rock, the NHS, Royal Mail, the forests. So here, Mandy lays out an understanding of patriotism grounded in state-supported national institutions, and her argument takes on salience in opposition to the coalition government's policy. Characterizing her party's approach as patriotic explicitly entails characterizing the rival parties as unpatriotic. When politicians deem themselves patriotic in opposition to their opponents, the most obvious division is between patriotic and unpatriotic citizens. But both groups lay claim to the nation. While their commitment to patriotism may be in question, their ability to belong discursively and legally is not. And so rival political parties may lay claim to patriotism and deem their opponents unpatriotic even as they advance opposing platforms. Both still occupy an insider status, which enables them to invoke patriotism discursively and protects them from exclusion when they're accused of unpatriotism. Claims of patriotism and unpatriotism also establish an implicit but more fundamental distinction between citizens and non-citizens. By specifying the character traits and histories that exemplify the nation, patriots reify the nation state. We can see this with appeals to national character, which tends to emphasize the singularity of a particular nation. Yet the reification of the nation state holds true even if their patriotism aspires to universality because it's enacted at the national level. A patriots, for example, uh, might argue that democracy is a patriotic virtue and that all human beings have the inalienable right to choose their political representatives. And yet they may still systematically disenfranchise non-citizens. Further, by working to enact democracy at the level of the nation state, patriots accentuate the distinction between nation states. As a consequence, Patriotism hardens the line between those who belong, uh, fellow citizens, whether patriotic or unpatriotic, and those who don't belong, non-citizens. I touched on the racialized construction of patriotic values earlier. Um, and if we look at the history of national institutions that underpin patriotism, we can also see how the very same mechanisms that construct some people as citizens and endow them with rights also construct others as non-citizens and enact violence against them. This is all by design. British citizenship, for example, took shape in the aftermath of decolonization in order to distinguish metropole from empire, native-born citizens from migrants, and white Britons from people of color. In the racial state, to use Goldberg's term, borders are erected between members and non-members and are maintained through legal institutions. Borders follow non-members within the space of the nation state as they're denied access to the welfare state and increasingly to other hallmarks of everyday life. At best, this may result in a psychological reminder of their outsider status. At worst, it may entail detention, deportation, or even death. Nor are the right documents a sufficient guarantee of membership for a nation's internal others, as the recent ruling against Shamima Begum has reminded us. People who are racialized as other are exposed to violence, while non-citizens who share the dominant racial or ethnic identity might evade border policing on the basis of their presumed membership. As non-members are created and excluded, Members consolidate their identity as a nation. Avowed patriots uphold the virtues of patriotism as an inclusive alternative to nationalism, or even as the opposite of nationalism. But both approaches qualify the nation as a category and distinguish between those who belong to the national community and those who don't. Avowed nationalists use patriotism as a proxy for a harder, more exclusionary nationalism by another name. By invoking a term that conjures universal values, they make the racialized character of their ideology and of the nation at large unspeakable. 
So I'm going to provide two examples of patriotism as exclusion, um, both exchanges between uh, Starmer and constituents, uh, because they tell us something about the interpretations and implications of political discourse. The first took place in April 2020. Uh, this was shortly after Starmer became labor leader, and during his campaign, he had already sought to distinguish himself from Corbyn by emphasizing patriotism. In his first conference as party leader, he had urged voters to take another look at labor. We love this country as you do. So in April, he held a teleconference with former labor voters in Barrie. During that event, one caller asked Starmer what he would do to crack down on anti-patriotism in the party singling out Diane Abbott and Clive Lewis for their comments associating Brexit with racism. Um, now, to his credit, Starmer didn't condemn the, uh, those two MPs, um, nor did he agree that anti-patriotism was a problem to be dealt with. But the ease with which the caller conflated support for patriotism with opposition to anti-patriotism, neatly placing two Black MPs in the latter category, reveals that appealing to patriotism served to divide and exclude. The second example took place in December 2020, when Starmer was a guest on LBC. A caller said that she opposed footballers taking the knee in support of anti-racism, and then made statements associated with the white supremacist Great Replacements conspiracy theory, which Starmer failed to name and challenge on air. After receiving widespread criticism, he issued a statement that, quote, the Labour Party stands for a patriotism that is built on the total inclusion of Brits from all ethnic backgrounds. So here again, patriotism was fundamentally divisive. The Great Replacement is a global conspiracy theory with Islamophobia at its core. By centering Britain in a language that excluded non-citizens and was silent concerning Muslims, Starmer created space for the racism and xenophobia underpinning the categories of citizen and non-citizen. So to conclude, amidst the global rise and resilience of nationalism, Center-left politicians have turned to patriotism as a means of acknowledging voters' attachment to, to nation while reclaiming it for progressive values. Labor's appeal to patriotism, like center-left parties everywhere, will not provide a buttress against nationalism. On the contrary, the impulse to divide underlies both ideologies and both discursive strategies. By extension, as sociologists of nationalism make sense of contemporary far-right political movements, we must be wary of promoting patriotism instead. Doing so risks bolstering nationalism by another name. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. And I think that that was such a you know thoroughly informative talk, which really um, smoothly moved from kind of seminal theories of nationalism throughout the twentieth century to discussing stuff that's happening right here and now. So I'm sure that all of us agree that that was a really informative talk. And of course. If you want to read any more of Megan's work, she has a book coming out soon, but you also have some, a couple of really informative papers in ethnic and racial studies and uh, current sociology, which I'm sure we'll talk about in the Q&A, because both of those are really powerful interventions. Um, so before we move on to the Q&A, um, Valu, do you want to do your talk, talk first and we can take all of the questions in one go? Well, uh, to be honest, it was perhaps a mistake me succeeding uh, Megan, because. Honestly, my style is just a lot more charlatan and slapdash, and it's not going to be anything as, as polished as that, and I'm, I don't think I'm going to compare favorably, but nonetheless, uh, also thank you to, the, to, to Ali and anyone else involved for the invitation, and genuinely for any of you just joining us today. I mean, I find it odd when there are far more compelling features of the, of the culture industry that might command your attention, but you still dial in for a, for a sociological talk on nationalism, but I'm nonetheless grateful. Um, but in, but in um, complementing, really, Megan's uh, typically wise words, I too, I guess, will be focusing on, on this predicament of left politics and nationalist capture. Um, but I'll be discussing both the in current English malaise, but I, would also, I will also try towards the end uh, to, to draw out some closing remarks on, on, on post-colonial theory proper, and particularly vis-a-vis -vis the, the ethno-nationalisms beyond the West as currently ascendant. Now, let me just start by saying that I, I think or I fear I've won myself a, a, a rather cheap reputation, if you like. Should I have a reputation in the first place? But nonetheless, but I won a cheap reputation as, as a perhaps righteous, perhaps even worthy critic of, of left nationalism. 
Um, I want to hear and start by saying that in a spirit of kind of more affectionate sympathy, that, that it, it isn't actually at all surprising that a left sensibility might be ambivalent or even seduced really by the nationalist wager. Um, you know, after all, as, as Benedict Anderson, you know, famously characterized it, it is nationalism, however we think about it, that stages for modernity, a, a sense of political community, a sense of collective identity that sits really, if you like, in, in an uneasy, as I kind of characterize it elsewhere, in an uneasy dialectical tension with the otherwise abstract and, and cold individualism of, I don't know, an enlightenment or commercial uh, modernity or however you'd like to ca characterize that individualist modernity. Um, similarly, it is, it is nationalism that, again, presses, like Anderson says, or what he calls a sensation of deep horizontal camaraderie, okay? That, that nation creates an intoxicating impression that we are indeed united in our equal standing and as one. And when seen like this, this deep sense of solidaristic sameness is of course vying, right? Of course it's vying formalistically for the same terrain as most leftist reflexes. I mean, you know, don't we ourselves, admittedly I'm presuming about the kind of political leanings and constitution of, of this audience, but you know, it's sociology or so whatnot. Uh, uh, but don't we ourselves want horizontal camaraderie? You know, do we not ourselves speak in the idioms of collectives or the people and solidarity? Of course, of course that nationalism is in fact wholly antithetical to the leftist or Marxist project is I think also well understood insofar as nationalism ultimately reconciles the polity to class stratification and exploitation, where it, wherein the realities of class conflict are subsumed, right? Subsumed by the falsely unifying ethnic ecology of nation. But still, nonetheless, formalistically, and in terms of poetics, certainly, nationalism does have considerable homophonic uh, uh, correspondence, correspondence or le homophonically leftist correspondence. And I think this muddling becomes better apparent when we actually unpack the terms by which a left nationalist apologia, as I'd call it, has emerged in today's little Englander present and, and its politics of a defensive anxious whiteness that will try to avoid uh, repeating or duplicating uh, too much of what Megan might have already covered. So I think it is best to essentially disentangle uh, uh, you know, three to four genres that, that currently overlap. Uh, uh, and again, I apologize if this is all old hat to you. I think some of you might have heard this already, but I don't know, I, I don't recognize most of the names present, so maybe it'll be reasonably, hopefully reasonably new to you. So the first of these can be characterized, and I think this is what Megan's getting at via Starmer. I think this, this can be characterized as simple party political expediency that sees stronger appeals to nationalist issues as necessary to strengthen electoral viability. And sometimes, yes, it's dressed up in a kind of, uh, uh, in the proxy of patriotism, but nonetheless, they see these nationalist fault line issues as somehow necessary or, or, or the engine of rendering themselves electorally, electorally uh, uh, plausible again. There is, an, of course, an assumption here that the population is innately anti-immigration and that therein this a priori fact simply needs to be appeased. Uh, and practitioners of this approach, and really they're trained in that kind of Blairite legacy of a focus group primed style of political wisdom or electoral wisdom. So they're not necessarily themselves you know, uh, uh, invested in nationalist politics. In fact, often they aren't, but they simply spy an opportunistic necessity here. And this of course speaks quite well to what, what um, uh, Megan has been just speaking of. Indeed, if I may say so, like to, <laughs> the last few months have felt, um, I don't know, I don't know how to put it really, but the last few months of, of Starmer's tenure has felt like one long advertisement really for my own book. But you know, I don't think you should buy the book and you probably haven't, but nonetheless, it does feel like it is almost hammy and kitsch in, in how kind of uh, the, the Starmer led labor is kind of confirming some of the tenets of that desperate electoral calculations. I mean, even the, the party apparatchiks are even speaking of, as Megan mentioned, 
quite literally about bedecking themselves in Union Jacks and sporting patriotic garb, whatever that might be. I, get, I gather that means like veterans clothing and so on. But of course, and, and, and of course, all of this is hammy and futile as it, as it is, but nonetheless, it is quite striking how, 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 how much symmetry or, or kind of transparent desperation there is. However, outside of that kind of electoral strategic calculation element, I think, and this might be more important, we also have a form of romanticized, melancholic, symbolic identification with the historic working class, which therein accepts the mediation of the working class, the working class figure, shall we say, as being exclusively white, as being exclusively nationalist, as being exclusively socially conservative, which is a term that, that the Bilou Labour faction, which reigns supreme at the moment, is very happy to use. And lastly, and I think this is quite important, also as being exclusively provincial. And I think the latter is, is quite decisive really, because what we see today is quite a winning, to be honest, winning geographic sp spatialization of a rooted patriotism versus an aloof and, and deracinated urban cosmopolitanism, right? So to use that kind of very tired neologism of the ubiquitous uh, uh, um, David Goodhart, in, you know, and his characterization is actually a really patronizing one, but they don't seem so fussed about it. They have seem, seem to have no qualms about that. But nonetheless, we, we have what he essentially intimates as the provincial and rustic somewheres, that being his phrase, who are the patriotic, but ultimately quite humble yokels and simpletons, juxtaposed against what he calls the anywheres i.e. the feral, the ethnically diverse, but ultimately and simultaneously elite and elitist cities. And we, of course, as an audience, all number amongst that particular characterization. So what is particularly galling, of course, is that this whole style of pseudo left commentary invokes class. And I don't think we've seen class in our political register with this prominence in a good 20, 30 years. So it certainly invokes class just as it actually empties it of any materialist or socioeconomic content or meaning, right? Instead, as Richard Seymour argues, the specter of class is deployed solely for cultural and nationalist or uh, political effect. Um, Relatedly, the third genre I have in mind is what we might call the post, a kind of post-Marxist, I think that's a fair term, post-Marxist intelligentsia that sees immigration and multiculturalism actually being constitutive of a wider neoliberal globalism, if we want to use that term, though I think the kind of all, all tried has, has the kind of first movers monopoly on it. But you know, here, here we have indeed a kind of array of intellectuals ranging from the quite theoretically involved, even quite engaging arguments of someone like Wolfgang Streak to the much more careerist, grifter dilettantism of someone like Angela Nagel. But nonetheless, for all of these figures, for them to be anti-neoliberal and to be anti-capitalist entails a rehabilitation of communitarian principles. So here, you know, Marxism ceases to be interested, I don't know, in the old chestnuts, the classic fair, global structures of accumulation, uh, rent extraction or rent seeking, labor exploitation, and, 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 the, and the small matter of wider human disposability. You know, instead it reads the task of, of uh, anti-capitalism as simply or straightforwardly co-terminus, um, co-terminus with, with the consolidation of national identity, but not least national borders. Now, now the, 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 the final genre for me is one that reads the, the electorate's alleged turn to nationalism or the significant element of the electorate's turn to nationalism as fundamentally being a deformed projection, okay? A deformed projection of anti-capitalist anxieties and distress. So it is argued here that this essentially misdirected anti-capitalist cry Yes, it needs to be harnessed. Yes, it needs to be navigated. Yes, we shouldn't alienate that electorate, but ultimately it needs to be redirected. So, th so the fourth of these I think is perhaps redeemable insofar as it is the only one that avowedly maintains an anti-nationalist end game. Um, and I do think perhaps this is something we'll discuss, discuss later. And this is what my good friend Gavin Titley, well, he's a, a, a well-known theorist in his own right, but Gavin Titley calls the plumbing issue. So essentially this is the left se sensibility that essentially thinks the piping has gone wrong. And some of the piping has gone awry and it anti-capitalism has ended up with a, a nationalism or a kind of uh, unhinged nationalism. But if we're just more tactful about it and kind of re, uh, I don't know, reassemble the, 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 the piping, we might find ourselves to in a more kind of uh, anti-capitalist favor, or, uh, which is a more favorable destination. 
But, but what ultimately happens here is that all of these genres become equally relevant to imbuing or um, affording affording the nationalist re register or sub resurgence with this incredibly ennobling alibi of class injury, an alibi of class rebellion, and all that certain so-called kind of anti-establishment um, free zone, right? All of which in my mind has become quite decisive for how a remade political right currently orients its, its hegemonic positions. And as I've already mentioned, and I think obviously here I, I, I risk duplicating or repeating what Megan has covered, but you know, some of what I've just said marries, of course, quite well with the current Starmer-led labor jockeying. And, 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 and Starmer, whatever his merits or demerits may be, and that's not for me to necessarily determine, but he is, of course, by I think his own admission, desperate to give appeals to, to England and patriotism an envious centrist caress, right? And needless to say, if I may just be quite facetiously polemical here, but not only does all of this result fundamentally in a grossly myopic distortion of what the left project could be, but it is also simply a recurring failure to understand that nationalism cannot be gamed for, for anti-capitalist ends. And I think this is what is often misunderstood. Nationalism is simply never a means to something else, uh, not least left collectivism. Nationalism is always in the uh, uh, final instance about its own autonomy as a force of modernity, its own nativisms, its own primacy of identity, its own exclusion in racisms. And anything, anything else is simply in my mind, a convenient accomplice rallied along the way to render its appeal all the more likely, or as Nasreen Malik puts it, it becomes merely a handmaiden. Um, and it of course, to state the obvious, and you will all know this, it is of course the political right that will always retain a more well-trained and ultimately sincere credibility when, when offered these terms. And even when it might be possible to occasionally make electoral great gains on this front, so to those of you who don't know, I actually come from Sweden as a young person. Uh, and so I, you know, I, I engage in what we might call Scandi watch. So, you know, it is perhaps there, uh, the, the Mette Fredriksson led social democrats in Denmark has in fact electorally benefited for this and find themselves in government. But what that same example did, uh, reveals is that it is also the case that under such terms, the left becomes not a vehicle of social democracy, but is instead summoned into power on the basis that it shall act as an honest dispenser and broker of nationalist politics, nationalist actions, and nationalist sentiments, as Meta Fredrickson does with great aplomb. Um, but anyhow, to, 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 to bring this back from a, from a non-Danish setting, I know, I mean, we are kind of, I don't know, they call us deracinated cosmopolitanism. We probably do watch a lot of BBC4 and Scandi Noir and all of that. Uh, but I think our literacy is about Denmark and such like might still be quite strange. So let me bring this back and simply say that the left's general self-defeating bartering today with nationalism is simply to misidentify with the leftist alibis that nationalism in any register across the 20th century has always solicited to such great effect. Um, um, however, also whether much of what I've said might be too familiar and also, to be honest, quite provincial as regards the increasingly irrelevant uh, uh, preoccupations of what we might even call a contemporary failed state England, as, as Pankaj Mishra put it in that famous LRB essay. Similarly, and I think this applies to both uh, Megan and I, we also know that this English left of whatever stripe remains a marginal player, right? Let's be honest, the, the current right has remade along its contemporary populist nationalist vein, reigns with a fairly unassailable and firm footing. As such, I, I might instead draw out in my closing stretch certain insights from post -colonial, the post-colonial context instead. Um, and, what, and which constitutes to my mind a much more expansive witness to nationalism's consistent co-opting of, of radically, radically progressive ambitions. Um, of course, the heady ferment and possibility of the, uh, 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 of the decolonial moment was teeming with leftist energies alongside a more general kind of world-making consciousness of anti-colonial global humanism uh, and unity and so on. But equally, we see a vast archive of post-colonial thought that still bemoans the and is vindicated that fatal wedding of a, that very decolonial moment to a nationalist premise that in time overrode other political possibilities, fating in turn uh, uh, a particular reactionary future. 
And one vital truth that I think post-colonial theory has consistently shown is that nationalism isn't simply problematic because it's exclusionary or violent or intolerant, though that too, naturally, of course, um, but it is also problematic uh, because it is essentially depoliticizing or pre-political to use the term, that, uh, the concept that Paul Gilroy offers. Namely, the, 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 the assertion of national identity becomes essentially the primary object of political desire itself. Politics becomes over, it's a term I overuse, but whatever, it, it's, politics becomes overdetermined here by an endless sequence of increasingly rabid assertions about cultural and uh, ethnic integrity, about uh, uh, majoritarian entitlement or priority, about the symbolic flagging of the nation and its history, and of course about various agonized laments uh, uh, about the presence of those who do not belong, right? I.e. Uh, uh, endless laments about those who are considered interlopers, those minorities, frontiers, and or kind of excessively cosmopolitan or naively leftist dissenters who require patriotic disciplining or redress. It's not for nothing that when Mo in the Modi or Hindutva clan want to deride leftist dissenters, they call them anti-nationals. And as Fanon presciently cautioned, though some superficial readings would sometimes suggest otherwise, but as Fanon presciently cautioned, the overriding risk for the decolonial moment is that the new nation, in trying to stake its sense of national authenticity and historical entitlement, itself becomes um, committed to its own ultranationalisms, tribalisms, and other new racisms, right? I think that being his precise phrasing from one of the two great chapters in the middle of Wretched of the Earth, uh, one of them being the trials and tribulations of the nation and the other one being on national culture. I forget which chapter. But you know, in this instance, post-colonial critique just simply makes painfully evident, and I say this as someone born and raised in my very early age in, in Sri Lanka, amidst the brutal upheavals in the cauldron of, of a 30-year nationalist civil war, that I think post-colonial theory makes evident that nationalism isn't just some instrumental premise, isn't just an expedient vehicle uh, uh, for some wider princi political principle or goal, as is often assumed but rather the assertion of national identity does itself become the political wage, the principal attachment of our claims on the state. Or as a kind of Sharil bin Hamdan put it when, when speaking about Malaysia, all politics collapses into the rehearsal of the ethnic question and little else, i.e. who belongs, who doesn't, who is authentic, who isn't, who is native and who is guest and so on and so forth. And, you know, I'm just going to end quite sh shortly, but, you know, what, what, what I think it's important to say that whilst in the initial decolonial era, this drive was tempered by the competing and not complementary, the competing imperatives of what we might call the communist wager, so central to the mid 20th century. Today, the nationalist compulsion really does act or reign with a full kind of autonomous abandon, right? Uh, and indeed, as Ravinder Kaur in a fantastic recent book called Brand New Nation on Hindutva and Neoliberalism, or, or how Arif Derlich's books, you know, vis-a-vis -vis India and China respectively, we, we see that the civilizationist nationalisms have also found an elective affinity with certain forms of what some people call state-managed capitalism, right? I think we can discuss that, but anyway, state-managed capitalism that has obtained particularly strong grounding across the global South and particularly amongst its newly emergent powers. Um, so in my mind, whilst the earlier communist hypothesis, if you want to call it that, represented a mitigating or moderating bulwark amongst the, upon the nationalism of the post-colonial moment, uh, we see that the state capitalist imperatives of the contemporary do seem to align particularly well with the nationalist terms of, of contemporary hegemony. And, and again, whilst this notion of state or authoritarian capitalism is a very dense debate, um, one thing that might be interesting for us to discuss is precisely how and why does state capitalism seem to draw such an easy affinity with these uh, ethno-nationalist forms. Um, Ali, do I maybe have one or two minutes left? So, yeah, of course. All right. Uh, I just want to note one final little, it's essentially a footnote, but one final ironically decolonial feature of today's global South nationalisms. Um, namely, I should mention like, like Chen Chen Zhang, who has an incredible paper, one of the best papers I've read of late called uh, Right Populism with Chinese Characteristics, but also Yao Lin, but also others have made kind of persuasively evident uh, 
much of right populist discourse in say China or India, but also elsewhere, um, it, is in, it is increasingly referencing the West as a cautionary tale, all right? A, a cautionary tale about an a, allegedly excess liberalism and allegedly excess tolerance towards minorities, uh, immigrants or Muslims, wherein the West is herein perceived as undergoing a naive and self-willed implosion from within. So again, something that is interesting from a post-colonial perspective is how the West really no longer features as some kind of Eurocentric beacon of modernization that many, you know, many early post-colonial nation-making leaders were obliged to reference. And nor does the West act as a reference of kind of violent and hypocritical reaction against which a post-colonial progressive politics might be pursued in contradistinction. Uh, but instead, instead, in a, in a sort of macabre, but still delicious decolonial reversal, if you like, the West is increasingly invoked as a salutary cautionary tale uh, uh, about the dangers of being inadequately nationalist, inadequately assertive about one's cultural cohesion and ethnic integrity, inadequately anti-immigration and or inadequately assimilationist. So I think I'll just stop there really, but it does again open up some interesting turns, I think, in how post-colonial politics is orienting itself amidst the continuous legacy of a colonial modernity and not least the specter of the West. Right, I'm done. Sorry, I think I spoke too long. My bad. Thanks, Valu. That was such a, once again, that was such an informative talk and I think that you brought a lot of energy that we all needed to, uh, to um, you know, really engage all of us with these themes in this particular moment. Um, and I think that the way that you also engaged with post slash decolonial theory is so appropriate for our time, but also for a historical reason. Um, you know, it was, it was only this week, so, so tomorrow we're doing a lecture on Indian nationalism. And one of the things we found out was that uh, Hindutva ideology itself was kind of formed in relation to Nazism and, and Mussolini in Italy. So I guess what's so important about the post or decolonial approach is that we don't even just bifurcate different nationalisms, but we realize how there are even connections between nationalisms in the West and the non-West. Yeah, so I think can I can I actually quickly say the in many ways the RSS is the longest running fascist entity in the world. And in fact, in some ways, it is an autonomous fascist and i.e. that others saw reference in it. It wasn't a derivative fascism. It was a formative fascism that has shown to be much more enduring than some of the European fascism that usually orient our reference point in theorization of what the fascist form is. Harry Hurian is also fantastic here yeah, about Japanese fascism as, as not derivative. As, and it, it's, a, um, it's, a, um, it's a, an awkward point for us, right? Because sometimes the worst of the post-colonial world, we want to say, well, it is bad, but it was, uh, it is uh, uh, your doing, it's the colonials doing, it's your inheritance. But if we want to be seriously decolonial, we have to establish some relevant, the, the, the discontinu discontinuities as well, and the, the degrees of historical and political autonomy that have informed those fascisms. Mm. Mm, exactly. So, um, so yeah, thank you both Megan and Valu for your amazing talks. We've got around 40 minutes or so for a Q&A. Um, so as I said, if you want to put your questions into the chat or if you raise your hand, um, I've got my eye on the participant screen. So I'll try and um, come around to you. And Joe as always has his eagle eye to make sure I don't miss anyone. Um, we've already got one question in the chat from Valentina uh, who asks, um, a question specifically for Megan, but I think it also um, uh, relates to what Vali was saying. And, and Vali is asking, the insight that patriotism and nationalism by extension cannot be thought as inclusive terms without exclusive is great. I was wondering whether there is something similar going on with the patriotic solidarity claims for tackling COVID, um, which is also legitimizing border closures. Can policies such as border closures, even if legitimized through a pandemic, can ever, um, can ever be thought without exclusive nationalism. Uh, Megan, do you wanna take that first? Uh, I'll start and then I'd, I'd also welcome Valu's thoughts on this. Um, this is you know, an ongoing issue, an ongoing question. The discourse is developing as we speak. Um, and so I'd, I'd welcome everyone's insights. Um, regarding her final question, can policies such as border closures ever be thought of without exclusive nationalism? Uh, and borders themselves can't be 
um, don't exist without exclusive nationalism. Um, and so, no, they, they can't be thought of um, that way. It is, it is interesting to look at um, the discourse surrounding border closures now, because this is one of the few areas where Starmer has spoken out against government policy, saying that uh, borders didn't close early enough. They're not um, closed uh, decisively enough or firmly enough. Um, you know, erasing the fact that Britain has one of the highest, perhaps the highest uh, death rate of COVID in the world um, at the moment. So it's regarding regarding COVID patriotism at large. There, there's a lot to say. Um, COVID is obviously a global pandemic, um, and if anything, you would what one would hope that this would be an occasion for global solidarity and um, an illustration of the inability of, or the. The, the inability of borders um, to, uh, to, uh, to, to guard uh, national life, um, perhaps, um, and the, uh, the, um, the, the, the fluidity and globality um, of, um, of a phenomenon like COVID. Um, and yet, in Britain and the US in particular, I would say, but not, well, not even really, uh, you see this in India too, actually, the weekly collapse. Um, but uh, in many countries, this has been an occasion for um, resurgence um, nationalism of a very particular um, backward looking variety um, claims that this is a war against COVID um, and wars are fought by nations, wars conjure um, loyalty um, and support for a government rather than um, you know, a critique of governments and rather than active um, responsibilities as citizens. Um, wars create borders between those who belong and those who don't. Wars create borders as well between good citizens and bad citizens, um, those who follow the rules and those who um, and those who uh, violate the rules and endanger the national community. Um, so I think that what, what we're seeing in COVID is a very, is a, is a resurgence of um, very long established um, older traditions of, um, of, of patriotism um, in, a, in a highly inappropriate context um, that I think ultimately will exacerbate um, COVID and, uh, uh, and, its, um, and its death toll worldwide. Um, we can make a similar argument about vaccine nationalism. Um, the, I, there were some headlines describing the first day um, the vaccinations were given as V Day, um, and of course echoing <laughs> VE Day um, and celebrations of the fact that the first vaccines were administered in Britain. Um, but it, it, if, if the entire population of one country is vaccinated to the exclusion of others, which is exactly what's happening, um, then that's no way to eradicate a global pandemic. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot to be said here. Um, those are just a few scattered thoughts, really, and I would welcome Valu's thoughts and Ali's as well um, on this topic. Um, but in general, yes, I, I completely agree with you that, um, uh, that what's happening with COVID is um, a resurgence of, of nationalism and appeals to patriotism in the interest of a solidarity that actually ends up excluding. Yeah, Megan, and I think that that picking up on that theme of global solidarity is so interesting because that's one of the main tenets of a decolonial delinking, whatever you want to call it. But at the same time that Cuba was sending their doctors all across the world to um, help other countries deal with the pandemic, Britain was going on about, you know, a world beating test and trace. <laughs> so there was always this kind of rejection of solidarity in favor of actually, a, you know, competition, neoliberal competition. Um, Vale, do you have any thoughts about this? Yes, of course. I, I, I got kicked out of Zoom, so I'm not sure if my internet is being particularly patchy, but do, do kind of wave your hands vigorously if you can't understand what the word I'm saying. Um, I, well, I, of course, uh, agree with a lot of what um, uh, uh, Megan has said. And I think what is interesting, when Starmer's only pointed move to actually critique the government was on the matter of the border. And of course, in one sense, this is convenient, right? It doesn't have to be played as a kind of de debased, degraded uh, nationalist politics. It can best be seen as a politics of life and public care. Um, however, it is interesting, the strategic manipulation, of you, and I don't know if you've read those articles, but they were really targeting the posters tied to that critique to red wall seats via social media. So it actually, in that way, it marries really well with what Megan was saying. They wanted the border to act here as a proxy for a wider unsaid politics that Starmer and them still can't fully commit to due to other electoral problems in terms of what the Labour Party is or the Labour constituencies are. But they were trying to use that as an unsaid. So it was the unsaid 
of talking about why is the border still open that might resonate. They were hoping, of course, it's utterly futile. Uh, that I don't think red wall seats are so easily misled, so to speak, uh, by these kind of slightly hammy attempts to, to code their political uh, iconography. However, let us let me just do something slightly more theoretical, if you don't mind, alongside what Megan was saying. Um, let's be honest, COVID is fundamentally a preview of climate change, right? Like it, I know it's it's it's, imper it's particulars are different, but it's a it's a preview of a wider climate catastrophism that is already underway. And as you know, I, I the Chuang Collective, a fantastic group of dissident Chinese Marxists, have written. You know, if anything. It, it, is, it demonstrates the ultimate anachronistic status of, of the nation. Of course, some of the statecraft will be useful, but essentially that's a defensive work. It's a post hoc defensive work that will never be up to scale with the ravages and debris of the violences and the damage and, and, the, and the fear and, and the vectors of disease, peril and catastrophe that are simply part of the, Andrew Lewy had a great article on this uh, about both capitalist modernity, but just modernity, but more generally. Uh, of course, nationalists want to claim this as, you know, to be honest, if I was them, I would revel in this. What does COVID show if not the ultimate conclusive peril of human mobility? Fundamentally, epidemically, COVID is an assault on our basic understanding of human churn, right? Humans should not move fundamentally, or, or, or if we see it from that pandemic uh, quarantine gaze. So the nationalists can make pretty good play to this, but fundamentally, they are also ill at ease because they simply can't reckon with that this has to be either a global matter or a nothing matter. Like you're either wholly ineffectual or it has to be uh, understand itself as a global governance in a post imperialist guise, obviously. Um, and I actually think I've spoken about this elsewhere. Climate change represents a fundamental problem for nationalism. It can do eco fascism, yes. It can do a bit of fortification, ramparts, and masculinist survivalism, yes. But fundamentally, it has understood, it is easy, it finds it easier to do things like nature, environment, and conservationism, because that's part of like nationalist understanding of romantic habitat and nature. But it can't do atmosphere, it can't do the cosmological, it can't do the abstract of, of, of the planetary. And in that way, it is simply as a governmental frame or a cultural political discourse, it's simply so ill at ease. So I don't know what that means, whether we will see the kind of conclusive radicalization of new generations, which are wholly unconvinced by nationalist calls, or whether we just get this horrible kind of warlordist survivalism anchored to a conception of national identity and national statecraft. Um, yeah, I can also say something about civic patriotism. Obviously, like I, I know a lot of people are very cynical about clapping on Thursdays and so on. And I know we are all cynical lefties and we're meant to be cynical about everything. But you know, the, the, the first time, the first couple of weeks, I didn't think it was a wholly misplaced thing. There seemed to be some kind of appetite for public spending. There, it seemed to be something to do with the NHS and a kind of defensive status of, uh, that the NHS matters and public spending matters. However, and, and this is the problem with civic nationalism and civic patriotism, that whole mythology just swooped in, right? became a ritual of patriotic uh, ritual. Um, so that is of course so predictable how quickly that collapsed, that, that energy of the democratic ethos, quickly it was smuggled back into VE days hatred and all. Sorry, I, it's saying my internet is gone, so I'll stop. Uh, Saskia described that as an emotional roller coaster. Um, so if because the internet yeah. gave me that's it's a roller coaster of <laughs> and I, I guess your comment about the climate reminds me a lot of the indigenous critique where where there's this point that the nation state has historically been uh one of the main players in, in ecological destruction so the nation state would actually be one of the last people that you would look to for help in addressing issues of environmental justice right so there's that nice interplay there um, Sarah, you've had your hand up for a while. Do you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, and yeah, well, nationalism, it is an emotional roller coaster, isn't it? <laughs> um, thanks so much for your talks. And um, I just wanted to turn um, to a little bit more of a quotidian experience because I think a lot of people are teaching about nationalism at the moment and it's become a much more popular subject. And you know we've had some very interesting conversations in 
supervisions about Captain Tom and clapping. And it, it's been a pattern for, for decades that patriotism, you know, is, is waning amongst younger people. And there's been a steady decline in, in, in support for either the monarchy or nationalism in the UK, like for at least the past 20 years. And I, I think I would describe a lot of the young people's responses as deeply cynical nationalism or deeply ambivalent nationalism, very uncomfortable nationalism. And you know, nationalism, it's gotten itself a very bad name and the expression ugly nationalism you know, is, is used increasingly to describe everything from COVID nationalism to right-wing violence in, in British, you know, cities. Um, so I'm just wondering, like, do we really expect Keir Starmer not to wear a poppy? I mean, of course he's gonna wear a poppy. He's like, you know, a politician, but do we really think those ideas of nationalism are popular? Um, well, maybe amongst a few people, but if nationalism is, I think, as Valu quite rightly said, mainly for itself, you know, how popular is it going to be in the future? I don't know. And I just sometimes wonder, like, I mean, I, I worry about nationalism. <laughs> I teach American right wing nationalism. Um, so, of course, it's worrying. But I just wonder, you know, is there another way of thinking about nationalism that it's, it's actually undergoing a period of significant decline? Megan, do you want to take that? I'm not sure if Valu's still here. here. Yeah. Here again. yeah, well, I, I was going to make this comment about uh, Valu's presentation that I think ours were very complementary in that respect, because I was I was discussing political discourse in the way that nationalism or patriotism, rather, is constructed from above um, and, uh, and, um, and articulated from above. Um, Valu's presentation focused much more on um, popular nationalism and nationalism as collectivism. And I think, Sarah, you've, you've identified this disconnect very clearly um, that labor, well, the labor leadership has a perception that apparently is supported by the consulting firm that they hired um, that the public wants to see, um, or wants, wants labor to, uh, to, um, to, to be distinctive, I think in some way, by, by, uh, by being patriotic, um, by, uh, by flag waving, by appealing to these familiar older symbols um, of patriotism, um, but in the very same report, there was an acknowledgement that this that there would be backlash from younger voters, from Scottish voters, um, and from um, BME voters. Um, that those are not insignificant <laughs> backlashes at all. Those are large and growing segments of the population. Um, so I think there there is a very real tension that you've identified between what is perceived as um, politically advantageous um, and what is perceived as across the political spectrum as appropriate behavior for, for a politician and what is the, um, uh, the lived experience of, um, of more progressive voters in particular, um, but really just of, of large demographic segments of the population. Um, and I wonder whether Valo could speak to, speak to that from, um, uh, from the perspective of nationalism as a horizontal or collectivist movement. Yeah, but it's absolutely. I, I'm, okay. I, I'm assuming I'm still here and you can hear me, and I'm all, but it's really interesting what you've raised about this age demic thing. So, I have actually a slightly contradictory take on that. So, in my own writings regards England, um, I take a left younger generation. I often say, under the last election, a core in victory and it's much consolation but it is telling that there is a youthful radicalization of a particular consciousness um, and i think this is actually a dialectical problem the more ruling head so heavily to nationalism the more it alienates those who find no success in the first place so really the, the overall play aspect allows for a reactive radicalization away from the, 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 the bluster national cheering. And I think that again, this is about youth radicalization, where Keir Milburn talks about quite well. I pivoted nationalism or Little England and nationalism. The matter of curating and sustaining a neoliberal common sense. 
well, a bit of neoliberal project. It still insists on it as a modern piece of statehood. It doesn't do well at sustaining it either sense. And I think that's quite a radical point about what currently of the complex. So I can hear us. Is it is it possible for yeah, you to okay, yeah. Is it possible for you to potentially turn your camera off to see if that makes any difference? Because we can't hear you too well. Oh, I'm so sorry. So that went all awry. That's better. Oh, okay. I mean, I've lost all right kind of real common sense, but whatever. Um, but what I will also say outside of a different demographic premise. And again, going back to some of the right in China, but also Baal's work on Hidutva, two points, but also Paul Gilbert's on the alt-right and the insomniac. There is a digital that is too famous for radicalization. And it often presents nationalism as orbitic, really breaks free this to the nationalist project. And I think that unfortunately suggests that the much more usual national is available. Valu, I don't think that I don't think that people can really hear you. Is it possible to potentially move closer to your router or something? Or Joe, do you have any other technical ideas that we can use? Yeah, getting I'll closer to the router is the only thing. I think we yeah, Joe says moving closer to the, to the router is pretty much the only thing. He's still here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you guys go on. I, okay. uh, we'll, we'll, come, to we'll, we'll come back to you because I think that quite a lot of uh, <laughs> quite a lot of analytical thoughts have been lost into the void of of um, poor Wi-Fi or, or whatever. <laughs> um, th does anyone else have any questions they wanted to ask? Potentially just addressed to, to Megan for the time being, because uh, I guess Megan, one thing that I find really interesting about your work is this kind of a uh, critique of this really firm binary that we have between, um, you know, different types of nationalisms. And you have that brilliant paper, which I put um, into the chat about uh, decolonizing the civic ethnic binary. Um, I was wondering if maybe you wanted to say a few words about that, because I think it's such a powerful intervention that would be really good to discuss. Sure. Um, so the, the paper that Ali is referring to is uh, published in Current Sociology um, in 2019, I think, uh, Decolonizing the Civic Ethnic Binary. Um, I believe it was, I believe it was Sarah um, who raised uh, civic patriotism in her question. It might have been someone else. Um, the argument that I make in that paper um, is that this divide in the nationalism literature between civic nationalism and ethnic nationalism, um, first described, I think, um, as um, Eastern and Western nationalism, tellingly, um, and then reformulated through several generations of nationalism theorists as being, you know, a spectrum of nationalisms or um, to uh, two different ideologies that might um, be articulated in different ways um, at different times in different states, um, that, uh, that the notion of civic nationalism at large um, was constructed through empire and exclusion. Um, and uh, I draw from decolonial theory um, in particular to make that argument um, and uh, point out that uh, the construction of the citizen, as I alluded to in my presentation today, um, took on meaning and took on salience through uh, the construction of the non-citizen um, and alongside that the construction of an individual um, deserving of rights um, took on meaning in opposition to dehumanization um, of entire um, swaths of the world's population um, and that these concepts don't have meaning um, don't really have any salient meaning um, without their without their opposite um, so to, to claim, first of all, that civic nationalism um, is preferable to ethnic nationalism erases this, um, uh, this relational construction of both. Um, and it also erases the historical ways um, that citizenship has been constructed um, in, uh, in Western Europe and in North America um, through exclusion and through racialization. Um, and I, I am hoping to build on that argument in this paper on patriotism, which as you can tell is in the works and um, uh, 
yes, but this, this, I think this, this binaristic logic and its um, and the way that it obscures um, the role of empire in constructing the nation um, is crucial to understanding what's going on today with patriotism. Yeah, it looks like Val is back. It, it does look like. Yeah. Am I back? Can you hear me? You are. Yes, clearly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. Hello. That's um, I'm sorry to the audience because essentially we have two. My partner is a school teacher, so she was also teaching a classroom. And to be honest, the younger kids are more important than us. <laughs> they deserve priority. May I address that youth demographics point again, or is that? Please, yeah, because I don't think we managed to hear you. So, so I'm not entirely sure what you did here and what didn't. So I'll just kind of start again. I think it's a really important point that was raised about where the, how the demographic play of this will unfold over the next two gen two decades. Um, and I actually have a quite contradictory take on this. And I think we need to look at Britain in one sense, but then kind of nationalism and post-colonialism in a separate instance. So in the first instance, I think Keir Milburn's generation left is really good on this. Essentially, you have big generations coming through that are more likely to be anti-nationalist. And it's essentially a dialectical issue here where the ruling right has pivoted so strongly to nationalist populist jockeying or bluster that any sense of opposition therein takes a cynical view of that nationalism. And so in that dialectical sense, there's an alienation of the oppositions coming through and that leftist uh, younger generations who, who also are the kind of new working class, right? So that through precarity, through rent dependency and through debt, um, they already carry out materialistic uh, features of a class consciousness or at least a class location that is potential, uh, that has potential for radicalization. But I want, what I think is really interesting, secondly, is, and I think this is not addressed sufficiently often, as the rule right pivot so heavily to little England of Brexit jingoism, they're abandoning or finding it much more difficult to sustain a coherent story about neoliberal morality, a neoliberal uplift, and the neoliberal common sense. So that whole Thatcherite wave that Stuart Hall captured so well, where neoliberal petty bourgeois morality is the obverse and little England and nationalism is the reverse, it's been flipped. Uh, little England and nationalism is the obverse, and what remains of neoliberal morality is the kind of residual feature of, of ruling right governance. Of course, it's still their principal material commitment, but they're not doing the su sufficient moral work on sustaining that common sense. And I think this opens, vacates a really interesting void for leftist politics amongst younger generations in, in Britain. Let me, however, say, again, going back to that Chen Chen Zhang piece, but also Paul Gilroy, who's written really well on the alt-right and the digital nationalisms, but also Basu's fantastic book on Hindutva, and he calls it Hindutva 2.0 as political monotheism. Elsewhere, digital affordances are proving particularly congenial to nationalist supremacisms for various reasons. In, indeed, even WhatsApp in Sri Lanka and India is seen now as a central modality of kind of nationalist frenzy. And we actually see that younger generations in China are more nationalist, what they call the netizen generation, is more nationalist than the older generation socialized into a slightly different political consciousness on the tail end of Maoism. So actually the youth demographic factor is maybe even the reverse elsewhere to a certain extent, where that huge youth bulge, as we say, seems to be much more heavily politically socialized into a nationalism as the principal political orientation or object of political desire, uh, however these things will play. And I think what's really interesting about what Paul Gilroy argues is that digital nationalisms, the alt-right nationalisms of YouTube and so on, they invite, and this gets to what Megan was saying, a completely ostensibly non-elitist project, that this is organic, that this is autodidactic, that this is self-learned, that this is in fact transgressive. Do you understand like that really taboo understanding that nationalism is, uh, is anti-establishment? And I think that has a lot of youthful flavor and can unfortunately do a lot, lot of work for emergent generations that also align slightly with the slight project of the self and a libertarian sense of being alternative and doggedly individualistic. And a strange unholy marriage will, it, it might materialize there. Yeah, and, and Balu, so you mentioned, you know, key thinkers like Hall and Gilroy and, um, you know, luckily Gilroy is still with us, unlike Stuart Hall, but both of them had this amazing analysis of nationalism in that particular era of Thatcherism. So um, 
Uh, Megan, coming to you first, do you think that, you know, thinkers like Hall and Gilroy and their critique of Thatcherism still is a fruitful avenue for analyzing nationalism in our present situation? Or do you think that it was very much tied to that period of Thatcherism itself? I think Valu is smiling because the question came to me first. It's a very, it's a, it's a big question. It's a compelling one. I, I, I think my impression is that Gurley himself argues that much of his critique of Thatcherism no longer applies to the to the present, in part because of many of the reasons that Valu identified um, of um, the, the, the the source of alt right citizenship, but also because of the the changing meaning of, of popular culture as a as a site of resistance. Um, uh, yes, I. I hmm. But yeah, there's there's a lot to think about there. Um, I yeah, I I would look to there uh, to to um to Hall um for um, the uh, the importance of cultural formations of nationalism and their enduring importance, perhaps their growing um, importance um, in a, in a different twenty first century context, um, but. Um, yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't necessarily argue that Thatcherism and in particular the, the hegemony of neoliberalism um, makes their, their work in the 1980s relevant in the same way um, and in the same context as, um, as you know, faced with contemporary nationalism. Mm. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think it's really good to be thinking about how thinkers are situated and the extent to which their ideas can be transposed. Valu, um, when Gilroy is describing your book, he says you skewer the idiocy of left nationalisms and you enumerate the depressing developments unfolding across Europe, conveying the shocking discovery that the aggressive pathology of Britain's Brexit is not, in fact, Britain's alone. Mm. So um, uh, Gilroy has praise for you in his usual poetic language. Uh, What's the your response? <laughs> let, me be, let me be entirely frank here. Why I was smiling at the question is, if I'm to be to be uh, self-effacing about my own attempt at a book. It is fun, it is so derivative of Gilroy and Hall, but particularly Gilroy. I mean, almost every coordinate there is kind of forged in kind of parameters that Gilroy has set out. Um, so I think Paul Gilroy's actual reckonings with the condition of Little England and nationalisms that course through a post-colonial melancholia and that has serves a kind of pathological self-destructive insularity is, more relevant than ever. I would say the Stuart Hall premise, and that's what I was trying to say earlier, is has changed somewhat. Because Stuart Hall, I think, fundamentally is talking about that fundamental moral project that Thatcherism delivered with such gusto. And why Stuart Hall is so interesting for me there, he always talks about as political rationality, a popular common sense, that these things aren't just top-down elitist machinations somehow. And you know, a lot of renegade or, or redoubtable leftists of the era were saying, Thatcherism has no popular mandate. It is simply a kind of the war state engaging in class warfare without a mandate. And, and Hall was so good at capturing actually, no, it is really settled and uh, uh, nested in all these textures of petty bourgeois England, Pujadist England, that it has uh, 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 adapted for its own project. Like, like Foucault talks about older liberalism. Um, but however, why I think that has lapsed somewhat is that I think for, for Hall, that kind of the, the, the police in the crisis or at that kind of little England the inwardness was the minor key for a capitalist morality that Harrison was pursuing. When, and I think Gilroy helps us understand that maybe this has switched to a quite considerable extent. And in fact, the dominant key is, is the solace or the false solace, but nonetheless a solace of, of national belonging and inwardness, particularly when it's anchored with the particular pathology of England as British nationalism. And that is, of course, the post-colonial uh, distortion or melancholia about a misunderstanding, an inability to reconcile itself to a more humble, modest reckoning, understanding of itself. And in this way, I think Gilroy is really good on about Britain. It has a slightly more dynamic nationalist death drive than other European, Western European nationalisms because it also understands itself as uniquely exceptional, uniquely exceptional with the imperial archive, and then therein with a special relation with the United States and the, the outside world historical prominence of English as the language, and how all of this distorts 
the English sense of where it is in this world and its sense of belonging. Yeah, I think that interplay between Western universalism on the one hand and then this little England universalism on the other, that, that tension is so kind of characteristic of the British English situation. Um, seeing as we're on a topic of Stuart Hall, people will know one of my favorite quotes is when Stuart Hall says there's nothing more English than the uh, cup of tea, that, that there's nothing more English than the British cup of tea. Um, and uh, Vali, you, you were talking about post-colonial melancholia through you know, Gilroy's lens. Megan, a lot of your work actually engages with themes of memory and so on. So how much is memory and productions of history, you know, one of the driving forces itself of nationalism? I think this returns to Valentina's question about COVID nationalism at large. Um, melancholia, I would argue, is more relevant now than ever. Um, I, I, that book, I, I think, was from 2005 for Gilroy, um, so a bit more um, contemporary than his than his you know, work on Thatcherism. But um, uh, but uh, Verdi and McGeever um, have an excellent article on Brexit nostalgia um, and how the moment of Brexit brought together and its aftermath have brought together two strands of um, what could be characterized as, um, well, two locations of, of nostalgia. Um, one Powellite nostalgia for a pre-colonial era that dr dreams of um, an island, Britain, an island, England really, and um, of, uh, of a white populace. Um, and it's really incompatible um, with, uh, with imperial nostalgia. And then the latter um, being a more recent um, nostalgia for grandeur, um, nostalgia for, um, uh, for power. <clears throat> and so what uh, Verdi and McGeever argue is that those two have been brought together um, at the moment of Brexit, um, you know, very effectively in the rhetoric of um, Jacob Rees-Mogg and others, um, increasingly mainstream in the Tory party. Um, I, I, Gilroy's argument about melancholia is really that it, it's just beneath the surface, um, that there, there's a longing for an empire, for, for a an identity that's been lost um, for a possession that's been lost, but an inability to name it as such. And in particular, an inability to name its effect um, on the nation at large. Um, there's, there's something latent in society at large about that melancholia. It erupts into violence um, in, in the form of, of, riot, of, of um, riots and in the form of um, more recently say vandalizing uh, statues. Um, but the way that he the way that he characterizes melancholia is something that pervades society at large, just beneath the surface. I think what we're seeing today is um, more overt, um, more more violent, less shameful shameful, if I can say that, um, uh, and more explicit nostalgia for empire that names it as such. Um, I would still call it melancholia because it's while it longs for empire, it doesn't acknowledge the ways in which empire has constructed the nation as such. It's really longing for an external grandeur. Um, so in that sense, I would, I would still call it melancholia, um, but it's, it appears to be much more mainstream um, and much more articulated more violently from the state than it was even 10 years ago. Um, so in that respect, I would say first, memory is key to the way that nationalism is articulated in the present and a, a particular form of memory that's nostalgia for imperial grandeur alongside um, a, a, a real unwillingness to acknowledge um, the violence of empire and the fact that, um, uh, uh, that uh, empire has um, made Britain a multicultural nation um, really. So, so yes, um, in response to that, uh, memory is crucial, um, and memory is uh, memory constructs the past um, in uh, in the image of the present. Yeah, and I think that you know, even thinking outside of uh, Western nationalisms, you see, you see how that's such a central point, right? So Bolsonaro's campaign was all about this image of Brazil as this kind of like um, Europe's one of Europe's greatest creations, and so on, in a way that completely skews what really happened with. Portuguese enslavement and Portuguese colonization and so on. So I think it's really, you know, you're working such a useful frame for thinking about nationalisms here, there and everywhere, right? It's, it's useful in that respect. Um, I've just noticed that we only have five minutes left. So one thing that I find quite useful to finish with is just asking you to maybe recommend one key text that you would recommend for people to engage with if they're really interested in some of the topics you've discussed today. Um, Valid, do you want to have the honor of going first? Oh, wow. 
Well, obviously there's so much, but I think much of what I mentioned might already be known. So I would actually re reiterate that earlier point about either Chen Chen Zhang or, or uh, Nandita Sharma. Nandita Sharma is much more expansive about how this logic of belonging and the outsider has convulsed all parts of the world, but through their different modalities. And we see the kind of shared formality of nationalism as the problem, as a pathology, but the modalities being very particular to different colonial histories and different particular political presence. But I would actually really recommend this Chen Chen Zhang paper just because just it orients us to a much bigger play in the present that we really don't understand. And I'm always stunned by how little we think about China. I mean, part of our post-colonial gaze is quite attentive to something like India, of course, uh, uh, and Mamdani and so on, who was writing about Central Africa and whatnot. But um, I think we've somehow let China just become, uh, the Financial Times can talk about it, and the rest of us can just be stum. Uh, but I think some of the more critical work that is now readily available, I think Chen Chen Zhang or the Chuang Collective, they don't write about nationalism and such, but they really do reckon with uh, the question of China in the 21st century. Cool. Um, I'm Megan. I've made a note of those recommendations. Thank you, Valu. Uh, I'm going to recommend a recent interview with Sylvia Winter that I'll drop into the chat. So it's not an academic article by any means, um, but she reflects on many of the themes that have come up in the discussion today, including COVID nationalism, including relationship between past and present, and including the racialization of the human. Um, and she, of course, um, has a long history of writing on uh, the construction of man with a capital M um, as a racialized category. Um, so I found, uh, I found this to be a really generative text um, for thinking about the relationship between these themes, as well as reflecting on the future and the possibility of, um, of climate catastrophe um, in light of um, the historical construction of, of race and nation. So I put that link in the chat. Thanks, Megan. And I'm just putting um, Vadu's recommendation too, because Sharon was asking about it. Uh, did that work? Yeah. Um, cool. So thank you so much, Valu. Thank you so much, Megan, for, for zooming in to our seminar series. Um, this will be stored um, online via the Cambridge Sociology's YouTube channel. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us via Zoom as well, and for those of you who joined via YouTube.